Welcome from Mayflower Congregational United Church of Christ, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. I am Reverend Dr. Lori Walkie, and behind the camera is Rick Bolin, our Director of Facilities and Communication. Thank you for joining us for the second installment of this month's sermon series, The Gospel According to Dolly Parton. I am especially grateful for the contributions to this series by our music director, Clint Williams, and our talented musicians, which this week include Carolyn Sargent and our choral scholars, Sabrina Brush and Nick Atkins. Every week, we send out an email updating you on the work and mission of the church, including how you can be involved. This week, there was information on the need for WizKid volunteers, the Voice Notary Public Project, our youth group, and a church-wide scavenger hunt that's happening next Sunday, just to name a few ways you can connect. If you'd like to be on that list, please contact the church office. The church office can also connect you with our small groups that are meeting online. And don't hesitate to let the office know if you need a call or a front porch visit from the minister. We are so grateful for the faithful giving of this community. And as you are able, we ask you to donate either online at mayflowerucc.org or by mailing a check to the church office. Let us begin worship with the practice of passing the peace of Christ to one another. May the peace of Christ be with you. Be sure to pass the peace of Christ to those who are also watching by commenting online. And another way to pass the peace of Christ is to pick up the phone or send a card to someone who needs a good word. The mobile church directory that makes it so easy to access content, contact information is proof that God wants you to make this a spiritual practice. Now let us enter into a time of community prayer where we trust each other with our joys and concerns. If you have a joy or concern you would like shared during this time, please email or call the church office by Thursday to let us know what's going on with you. As usual, we begin this time with joy. The birthdays we celebrated this past week include, but are not limited to, Susan Douglas, Sherry Gibson, Emily Graham, Francis Hoppy, Johnny Wynn, Beth Payne Burke, and Steve Matthews. For the lives of these beloveds, let the people say, thanks be to God. For the reprieve from the hot and humid weather, let the people say, thanks be to God. And as you may have noted from our email this week, there are a lot of opportunities to connect in this community, from scavenger hunts to Bible studies to notary public volunteers to blue jean drives for the Homeless Alliance. And for the deepening of relationships, the meeting of needs, and the strengthening of the ties that bind, let the people say, Thanks be to God. Now let us turn to those things that weigh more heavily on our hearts. I invite you now to say aloud a name or a place that may mean something only to you, but that will be enough for us to help you carry it. You are also welcome to add your prayers as a comment online right now. Let us be in prayer together. Gracious God, we pray for justice for Breonna Taylor, for Jacob Blake, and for Julius Jones. We lift up Jerry and Judy and Vera and Kate, Cindy and Amy. We hold vigil for our health and medical professionals and their families as they continue to serve on the front lines. We are devastated, Holy One, by the destruction of hurricanes and wildfires made worse by our denial of climate change 
and be with those who are working to help Louisiana recover and for those who are trying desperately to get those wildfires under control in California. We trust that even when we do not know what to pray or how to pray, that the Spirit intercedes on our behalf. Come to us, Holy One, abide with us, and grant us your peace that really does surpass all our understanding. Amen. I am a seeker, poor sinful creature. There is no weaker than I. seeker, and you are a teacher. You are a reacher, so reach down. Reach out and lead me, guide me and keep me in the shelter of your care each day. I am a seeker, and you are a keeper. You are a leader, won't you show me the way? I am a vessel that's empty and useless. I am a bad seed that fell by the way. I am a loser that wants to be a winner. You are my last hope, don't turn me away. Cause I am a seeker, a poor sinful creature. There is no weaker than I am. I a seeker, and you are a teacher. You are a reacher, so reach down. Reach out and lead me, guide me and keep me in the shelter of your care each day. I am a seeker, and you are a keeper. You are a leader, won't you show me the way? And you are a mountain, from which there flows a fountain. So let its water wash my sins away. I am a seeker, and you are a keeper. You are a leader, won't you show me the way? Will you pray with me? Gracious God, as we read about the wilderness wandering of the ancient Israelites, it is not exactly flattering. They were headed home, although it couldn't yet be marked on a map and there was no estimated time of arrival. They were walking on a promise, a hope, a desire for normalcy. But... As the text says, the people became impatient on the way. So they complained a lot. They complained about the food, about lost familiarity, about the seeming endlessness of it all, about not having a settled life. They complained even though they knew there will, would eventually be a time when they would get there. 
we know a thing or two about that. Almost six months ago, news broke of the first Oklahoman to die from COVID-19. And even though we were a bit shaken, the people became impatient on the way. Two months ago, we learned that a 13-year-old became the first child in Oklahoma to die from COVID-19. And we were shocked and heartbroken, for it turns out that the virus will attack the young and the healthy. But the people became impatient on the way. A few days after learning of the first pediatric death from COVID-19, it was announced that our state held claim to the first governor to test positive for the virus after he attended a super spreader event without wearing a mask or practicing social distancing. But the people became impatient on the way. Time and again, the so-called pro-life contingency has claimed that the virus is only deadly for the elderly and those with underlying health conditions. The people became impatient on the way. But some of us are grieving the death of our last living grandparent this year. Some of us believe that underlying health conditions shouldn't be a death sentence. Some of us are unwilling to give up our parents, our children, our school teachers, our elders, our neighbors, and our humanity, even though we are grieving the loss of familiarity, the seeming endlessness of it all, and not having a settled life. So let it cease to be said of us, that the people became impatient on the way. Instead, Holy One, let it be said that we trusted that we would find our way home together, gladly bearing each other up, because all of us need all of us to make it. We pray in the name of unconditional love, which has yet to fail us. Amen. Now let us say together a version of the Lord's Prayer, a translation by members of this congregation. Our Creator, who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For you reign in the power that is love, now and always. Amen. Take 
The sermon this morning comes from Dolly Parton's song, Jolene. Jolene, 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 I'm begging of you, please don't take my man. Jolene, 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 please don't take him just because you can. The scripture lesson also comes from 1 Samuel chapter 18, Verse 1, when David had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was bound to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Here ends the readings from several traditions. May God grant to us wisdom and courage for interpretation. Jolene. It's been covered by more than 30 singers over the years in styles that range from Olivia Newton-John's 1976 disco version to the rollicking White Stripes version to the goth rendition of the post-punk band The Sisters of Mercy. Dolly Parton wrote and recorded Jolene in 1973, and in early 1974, it went to number one on the country charts. In 2011, it posted at number 219 on Rolling Stone's list of the 500 greatest songs of all time. Lots of people are familiar with this song, but really, lots of people know this song because it's an other woman song. Dr. Nadine Hubbs, professor of women's studies and music at the University of Michigan, and author of several books, including Rednecks, Queers, and Country Music, explains that the other woman song is a sub-genre of the cheatin' song. A cheatin' song is usually sung by a man who is brokenhearted and is lamenting the lady lover who's cheated on him. There are literally thousands of these songs. If you think about music itself as the multiverse and country music being one universe, there is a galaxy in that universe called the Cheatin' Song. And if you go into that gallery, galaxy, there's a solar system filled with songs by women who are singing not to their man, but to the woman who is about to take their man. Typically, Dr. Hubbs writes, when female country artists sing to or about the other woman, the address is adversarial, if not downright menacing. 
Examples include the Loretta Lynn classic Fist City and Carrie Underwood's 2006 number one hit, Before He Cheats. In Fist City, Loretta Lynn warns the other woman, you better move your feet if you don't want to eat a meal that's called Fist City. She refers to her rival as trash, a slur that Underwood also invokes along with tramp in imagining her rival. But Jolene is a strikingly different kind of other woman song. Dolly speaks to the other woman in a way that could certainly be described as loving. Far from adversarial, Dr. Hubbs continues, the lyric starts as a plea and quickly turns rhapsodic, an ode to the other woman's beauty and desirability. Parton's narrator rehearses the incomparable qualities of Jolene's hair, her skin, her eyes, her smile, and her voice. She proclaims her vulnerability to, and even contingency on, Jolene. My happiness depends on you, and whatever you decide to do, Jolene. This affectionate plea has caused more than a few musicians, fans, and scholars to wonder if there is a different reading of these lyrics, a homoerotic reading, a reading that opens up the possibility that the narrator and Jolene get together if the guy doesn't work out. Dolly tells two different but mutually compatible stories about Jolene and its origins that effectively sustain both hetero and homonormative readings of the song. And this gives the song, as Dr. Hub describes, a queer aura, one that better speaks to and acknowledges the spectrum of human sexuality, which is particularly important given country music's reputation as hyper-straight and homophobic, which is not unlike the reputation of the church and traditional interpretation of scripture as hyper-straight and homophobic. Homophobia, though, is not what we actually find in scripture, which you've heard from this pulpit and many other pulpits before, but I'm not sure it's enough to explain that the concept of homosexuality as we understand it did not exist in ancient Israel or in Jesus' day, or that it is enough to dissect Paul's Greek to show that he wasn't homophobic either. The church has some ground to make up. So perhaps instead of simply saying, all are welcome, the church needs to regularly and explicitly name the very real queer aura that exists in scripture. Take, for instance, the relationship between David and Jonathan. You'll remember the story of David from Sunday school, the boy who took out the giant Goliath with just a rock and his slingshot. David is usually thought of as a man's man. After he felled Goliath, David cut Goliath's head off with Goliath's own sword. As theologian Stephen Patterson recalls, when I saw the color illustration of this in my Bible, I thought it was cool. Another legend relates how David won his way into the royal family by presenting King Saul with the foreskins of two hundred Philistines. This was not illustrated in my Bible. Eventually, David himself would become king, subdue the Philistines, and establish a kingdom that would be the symbol of Israel's golden age for centuries to come. But here's something Bible school doesn't often teach about David, the toughest, meanest warrior king in Israelite history. David loved Jonathan. Jonathan was King Saul's son. 
The 18th chapter of 1 Samuel describes their first meeting when David appeared before Saul, still carrying the head of Goliath in his hand in this way. When David had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was bound to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. The story of David and Jonathan's love is one of the great stories of the Bible. It is a classic tale of star-crossed lovers. King Saul soon becomes jealous of David because his prowess as a warrior exceeds even his own. But Jonathan conspires with David to keep David safe from Saul's wrath. When Saul discovers their relationship, he explodes into an angry rage. Do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse? Later, as David and Jonathan prepare to part ways, the Bible describes a most tender scene. They kissed each other and wept with each other, and David wept the more. The saga ends when after many months, David learns that both Saul and Jonathan have fallen in battle. His lament includes these touching lines. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Greatly beloved were you to me. Your love to me was wonderful, surpassing the love of women. Dr. Patterson reminds us that for many years, readers of the Bible have passed over the love angle in this story, assuming that the language of intimacy and affection was simply a peculiar way of describing a very close buddy-buddy relationship. But recent studies by scholars of the Hebrew Bible have placed this story in its ancient context and shown that it is indeed a love story. This, of course, is not the only relationship in scripture that can be read as queer, which is itself a whole sermon unto itself. But while sexuality is a significant part of our humanity, it is not the most important thing about any of us. It has, however, been used against too many of us as a tool of condemnation. So for a congregation to shout from the steeple that God loves the rainbow and that the Bible tells us so would really be a good use of our time. It would very likely save lives, given that research overwhelmingly shows that queer youth are much more likely to self-harm than their straight peers. The church can do something about this first, by affirming people who are LGBTQ+, but also by lifting up examples from scripture of same-sex love and intimacy. Perhaps this is not where you thought this sermon would go. It isn't often that preachers use the word homoerotic in a sermon. And this was, wasn't exactly where I thought the sermon would go either, but that really isn't unusual. Sermons can go a hundred different directions. There are always many threads to pull, and you never know where the Spirit will lead. This is one of the things that keeps the Bible interesting, that there are an infinite number of readings of the text, readings that can harm and hurt, readings that can help and heal, stories that can be taken in one direction or another or another or another. This is true, too, of Dolly's Jolene. There are other threads to pull in this song other than its possible queer interpretation. There are other readings to consider. Journalist Shimi Oliai interviewed Tokyo Shashwale, a member of the Black Consciousness Movement in the late 1960s, 
and part of the armed resistance movement to end apartheid in South Africa. Mr. Sheshwale was arrested in 1977 for his anti-apartheid work and was sentenced to 18 years imprisonment at Robben Island, a prison that also housed anti-apartheid leader Nelson Mandela. After years of abuse in prison, Mr. Sheshwale said that at a certain point, the guards allowed Mandela to play music over the loudspeakers for the entire prison. When he was asked which songs Nelson Mandela played, he said, Dolly Parton, and he loved Jolene. Why? For those in prison, it was not an other woman song. It was the voice of a sorrowful spirit who is about to have everything taken away, but also a voice that had enough hope to make a plea that someone might act differently in response to that pain and hurt. It wasn't just those who were imprisoned who heard the lyrics. Imagine a dark night in those cells when Jolene is playing over the loudspeakers. Those imprisoned heard the music, and on the other side of the wall, the guards, the guards were listening too. And that is enough to wonder if the words worked on the hearts of the guards, a reminder to them that they had a choice to do no more harm, perhaps even to help, to resist evil, to do justice. This too is how we might hear this song, as those who have the power to hurt or to help another person, to ask ourselves who in our lives are pleading with us to have mercy, to choose kindness. Those who are saying to us, my happiness depends on you and whatever you decide to do. We never hear what Jolene decides to do. The song itself is left unresolved. But our relationships, the choices we face, the opportunities set before us, they don't have to be that way. Our challenge is to carry that question in our hearts. If someone's happiness depends on you, what will we decide to do? Let's go with a word of blessing. And now, May the power of God and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, which really does surpass all our understanding, go with every one of us, abiding in us, lifting us up, and making us whole. Let us go in peace, pray for peace, wage a little peace, and love one another, every single other. Amen.